hopefully, you know, maybe somebody will just kind of get charged and decide, gosh, I need to go do something like that. And I've always wanted to go down and fish the green or I wanted to go fish this or whatever. Don't put it off. You know, if one thing this pandemic has taught us is don't put off that, you know, that trip that you wanted to do. Don't put off hugging that person or telling that person how much you feel about them. You know, do those things now. Don't put it off. That was Joel LaFollette with a powerful reminder for you today. It's time to check yourself back to the bucket list today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how's it going today? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. If you're new to the podcast, uh, stop right now and click the subscribe button in your app of choice. This will make sure that you get that next episode delivered right to your phone uh, when it goes live. So click that subscribe button if you haven't uh, already. Before we get started, let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsors. In today's world of mass-produced products, Stonefly Nets has reclaimed the tradition of handcrafted care with their custom wood landing nets. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get your custom net today. That's wetflyswing.com slash stonefly to get started right now. Joel Follett, head man at Royal Treatment Fly Fishing, is here to uh, sh- give us a little inspiration. We find out about Joel's number one destination that he can't get to uh, right now, his go-to gear for salt, and his family connection to driving fast cars on the motor speedway. Uh, lots of good stuff from Joel today, a good uh, diverse background, and uh, so this is going to be a good one today. Without further ado, here is Joel LaFollette from RoyalTreatmentFlyFishing.com. How's it going, Joel? It's going great this morning. How are you? Good, good. Thanks for uh, taking the time. Uh, we ha- had a, l- a few minutes there trying to figure out this the, the Riverside, the, the program I'm using, but I think we got it. We got you on your phone. So we're going to talk a little bit. You're, uh, you're, you've got a great fly shop. Um, you've got a, a long history you know, in the Northwest. We're going to dig into some of that today. Maybe talk about some big fish, some big species that you've uh, dug into. But before we get there, talk about how you first got into fly fishing. Oh, well, <laughs> I've been basically doing it all my life. So uh, I, um, uh, my mom died when I was young. And so I went to live with my grandparents for a while. Mom, my dad, you know, tried to figure things out. He, he tried to, um, you know, hire Mary Poppins to take care of us while he worked, but she had a gig with uh, Disney. So uh, in the meantime, uh, my grandparents uh, raised me for a few years. And um, my grandfather was a, um, a very avid fly fisherman and fly tire and not used to having uh, kids around. He would retreat to the basement in the evening after dinner. And uh, I was allowed to sit and watch him at the tying bench as long as I kept my mouth shut. So uh, I would go down and and watch him tie flies and drink cheap red wine. He was drinking a cheap red wine, not me, but uh, I would watch him. I was about seven years old at the time. And uh, I would read through his stack of field and stream and outdoor life magazines while I watched him tie flies. And, you know, about six weeks into my sitting on this little bench, um, I, he asked me if I wanted to try it. And I've been watching him tie um, bucktail rolled royal coachmans for that period of time. And I sat at the bench and tied one from start to finish without really any instruction because I'd been watching absolutely every step for, you know, six weeks. And so that kind of started me down the path. And then he, uh, you know, he took me to the Metolius and I caught my first wild red side uh, on an old bamboo rod that I still have. And um, that was pretty much the end of it. I mean, I've been fly fishing and fly tying ever since. And and then you eventually, you know, doing it your whole life, then you eventually got into the fly shop. Uh, Talk about that. What was the first, um, how'd you get into, you know, you own a fly shop now, but I know before that you worked for a couple shops. How'd that all begin? Well, I've had a very, very careers, you know, I've, I've done, uh, I was actually a commercial fisherman for, you know, for eight years when I got out of school and then uh, moved back to Portland, became a photographer, did that for a while and got into race car driving and did that for a while. And, um, um, was in between gigs. I I finished up a project for a friend of mine and he had sold the company. We'd worked really hard to get it built up and sold the company. I got a, um, a severance package and, uh, I decided I was going to do something 
really fun. And I walked into a local shop in, in uh, Lake Oswego. It was brand new. Uh, two people from out of state had decided to change their entire life and open up a fly shop. And um, I hung out for a while. And, and next thing you know, they asked me if I could come to work for them. And uh, they really couldn't afford to pay me, uh, but uh, I didn't really need to be paid that much. And so I uh, uh, hung out there, and next thing you know, I'm managing it. And they just didn't have the funds to really r- to to do what you know when you when you start a business, you you know there's 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 definitely a period of time when you have to have a little bit of a cushion, and their cushion wasn't large enough. And I was uh, I was going to just let them kind of figure out that whole thing and go guide for a while. And I was hooking up a drift boat and I got a phone call from Kaufman Streamhorn from uh, Lance and Randall Kaufman. And they wanted to talk to me and I went over and talked to them and I ended up at Kaufman's for 10 years. And uh, eventually, you know, those of us here in the Northwest know the story, what happened with that particular fly shop. And I left before the demise and uh, I was going to get back into photography, but, um, my my friends and customers told me I needed to open a fly shop. So in in 2010, um, you know the economy wasn't the the best we'd seen. Um, I raised a little bit of money on my reputation alone and opened up a a fly shop here in West Lynn near my home, and uh, the rest is history. There you go. So and now you're out. Uh, yeah, you're out in uh, West Lynn and uh, right off uh, right off the river. And uh, I'm curious. So, so, what was the fly shop, Lake Oswego? Was there a name to that? Was that? Yeah, it was called Buffalo Creek Outfitters. It was a little Orvis store, and, and uh, Orvis had convinced them that it was a great opportunity because they've been doing quite a bit of sales in, in women's clothing in that particular market. And so they did they did kind of you know they had a space that was probably too big, and they spent a lot of money on stuff and and. Uh, but with with women buying clothing from Orvis, most of it is mail order, and it continued to be mail order. So that really didn't crack the nut with that particular location. And so uh, the fly shop portion, though, I saw was had some potential because uh, you know with a proper size space for the amount of of sales that we experienced uh, in that little shop, just selling Orvis products and then you know bringing in some real fly lines and things like that. Um, it could definitely pay the overhead. And that's, you know, one of the business lessons I ner- learned just from being in the business. And then obviously working at Kaufman's and seeing how a very robust fly shop, when I first went to work for him, uh, operated and stuff, again, was a very uh, opportunistic business um, education. And uh, I'm very grateful for all of that. I'm really sad that, you know, it ended up as it did. But uh, uh, nevertheless, you know, it's, it's really great. Uh, one of the guys that I work with at Kaufman's, Randy Stetzer, has joined my staff here recently. And uh, so now um, I have, you know, in, in this industry, in the fly fishing business, you know, the fact is, is that you can buy this stuff just about anywhere. Uh, but it's the people that you have behind the counter that really make the difference. You know, that builds the business and makes the, and builds the community, which is what it's all about. And having Josh Lynn and Randy Stetzer, uh, as as a as a foundation for this you know for my shop uh with myself uh between us we have close to probably 130 140 years of of experience you know combined experience and then you add my wife jennifer who is absolutely an incredible instructor and then our part-time staff and we just have a um, a vibe in the shop that is just uplifting and inspiring and and it's fun i mean everybody's having a great time and and uh, um, we really enjoy you know what we're doing and that's i think it shows and so it's a it's a it's a it's a fun place to be now if i remember correctly you come from a family that had a shop here in the portland market yeah exactly that's why i'm 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 kind of interested i um you know i've I'm, been in i've been into your dad's shop back in the day yeah yeah totally yeah no it was uh we kind of we were on the other side of town and i you know i mean kaufman's was always the biggest thing you know it was always like okay the kaufman's is the big shop and that's why it's it's kind of interesting to me you know you've got the lake oswego shop um i mean but you've it seems like the kaufman's thing obviously was a good um 
the way it went down and you, you were left there, I mean, you have your own shop now, right? So it seems like almost it worked out pretty well for you. Is that kind of how you see it? Well, it, it worked out well. Obviously, that was a very tough time. I mean, the economy, you know, the circumstances, all of that, it was, it was not pleasant to be a part of that. Uh, and, um, you know, and then you're, you know, working out of that shadow for a while, but I think, um, you know, in the end, uh, the community, like I said, that we've built around the business has done a great job of supporting our business, you know, and, uh, we, you know, I mean, the whole reason to have a fly shop is that you enjoy it. This, you know, I, I, like with, when I was racing cars, for instance, okay, they always said that, you know, automobile racing was a great way to make a small fortune as long as you started with a large one. Well, fly, fly shop ownership is only slightly better than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so it's, That's awesome. uh, you know, it's, um, uh, it's a great industry and I've, you know, I've been a part of it. I've served on the board with AFTA and I've, you know, I've got a lot of the, the cool thing is I've been in it now for over 22 years. And one of the things that you do is you build relationships with your suppliers, with your customers. Um, uh, and, and those relationships are what fly fishing and fly fishing retail is all about. And so having, uh, relationships with suppliers that go back that long and having relationships with customers that go back that long. Um, it's just like you're dealing with friends and that's, uh, that's a, a, a wonderful way to have a business. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. And yeah, and I am, you know, the, the Kaufman's I've heard some, I don't know the whole story about how it went down. Um, but I've heard some, well, things. it's like I said, it was sad. It was, it was just a lot of circumstances and I don't think we need to deal with that, but I think that, uh, you know, it, like I said, it was a great business, uh, education, uh, what to do and what not to do. And, uh, I've tried to build my business, you know, on those lessons. And, um, uh, I think we've been relatively successful. We're, we're approaching, uh, celebrating our, our 11th year in business here in Westland. And, um, uh, hopefully we'll have a big party. <laughs> so <laughs> nice. last year we had to cancel it because of COVID, but, uh, but nevertheless, I think we'll, you know, we'll celebrate. I mean, it's, and like I said, it's truly a community effort. So it's been fun. Well, we were talking on the email before getting on. We were talk, trying to think of a maybe a topic to dig into. And you mentioned that you love chasing big fish. And we had um, recently, I had uh, Larry Dahlberg on, who's like, uh, you know, Oh, yeah. You know, Dahlberg, the Dahlberg diver and some of that yeah. stuff. But he has his whole thing yeah. was chasing big fish. So we we talked about some stuff there. That was pretty fun. But I'm curious if I was to ask you, you know, what, you know, if you had to pick one fish, one of these big fish, the chase, wh which one gets you fired up? Maybe take steelhead and, and salmon out of that mix. What, what else is left? Do you have anything? You know, where would you be going? Well, boy, I tell you, there's there's nothing. I mean, I, I like <laughs> I've always said I love fish with bad attitudes. And uh, when you get into that, you're 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 looking at at saltwater species. And uh, I've tangled with uh, with giant trevally in Christmas Island that were just scary. In fact, uh, one fish on Christmas Island that that took me for a ride, um, I literally sat in the in the boat uh, afterwards for you know 20 minutes, shaking from adrenaline. Uh, and we never got close to him. I mean, he came up on the flat, took my fly, and left, and just absolutely the eye to eye contact with a fish that was over 120 pounds uh and then being attached to him with what you felt was a very large stick at the time but turned into a little you know trout rod as he peeled line off is that can kind of get your adrenaline going but um recently you know in the last few years i've been going down i have a friend who does um, mako fishing down out of san diego uh, conway bowman and i love I love the ocean. You know, I, I, I spend a lot of time on the ocean as a young man. Uh, I'm at home at sea and I love getting out there. I love the sea life. I love, you know, I just love the smell of salt air. And uh, uh, to be really brutally honest with you, fly fishing for mako sharks is not a technical sport. I mean, you're, you're chumming them in on a chum slick. And then once they get up there, then you're casting to them with a big popper the size of a chicken uh and trying to get him to take a basically a dry fly on the surface uh but being able to be that close to a incredible creature and then attach yourself with you know um a string and watch what happens is extremely exciting and having a, a mako shark that's 
you know, five, six, seven, eight feet long, come busting out of the water and fly 15 feet in the air. You know, you only have to do that once to get hooked. I mean, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. And uh, obviously it requires specialized tackle and, you know, an understanding of tying knots um, or, you know, the willingness to just turn it over to Conway and let him figure it all out. But I love, you know, when I go down to fish with him, I spend time tying my own flies. I, I rig up my own leaders. You know, I make sure that my fly lines and my backing connections are all good. And, you know, that's the part of fly fishing that I love, that technical part, you know, that part where I get to take a reel and lube it up and make sure it's going to work and not come to a screeching stop when, a, you know, something races off. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a cool sport. And anything in the ocean, you got to understand, anything in the ocean is either fast or dead. And so uh, it's it's just fun to tangle with saltwater species. Yeah. And you mentioned, and it sounds like, do you guys do some hosted trips? Is that what you do out of there? Or? Yeah. Jennifer and I have been enjoying doing some hosted trips down to Mexico, you know, taking folks that have either you know, our, our advanced saltwater anglers or people that are brand new to the sport and taking them down for just a really fun time down in Punta Allen and Ascension Bay, uh, fishing for bonefish, fishing for permit, um, you know, know, hooking up with tarpon and barracuda. Uh, you know, it's just a, it's Ascension Bay was my first saltwater destination probably back in the early eighties, uh, uh, maybe late eighties. And it was, it was so cool to you know, experience all that. And, uh, it's still basically the same. I mean, I can go down to Punta Allen and, uh, the Palapa that I stayed in on the beach is still standing, you know, and, uh, I wouldn't want to stay there now because it looks a little rat infested, but it was rat infested at the time. <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. Just, you know, but it's, uh, um, uh, it's a, it's just, a you know, that's particular sport. I will warn people that haven't done any saltwater fishing. Don't do it because if you do, you'll spend your entire waking life trying to figure out how you can get back there and do it again. That's it. That's it. Yeah, that's 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 what. And then, you know, you mentioned. Um, so you got the Mexico. You got Christmas Island. Between those two, are they kind of equal? If you had to choose one of those trips, well, they're different. You know, uh, Christmas Island is is you know for, for beginner bone fishers, it's perfect because you know you get to fly to Hawaii, spend a you know spend a day in Hawaii, go down and do Christmas Island, and Christmas Island is like camping in bonefish because the accommodations and the food are not necessarily top drawer. Uh, but it's a unique experience and it's, it's one I highly recommend, but the, the experienced angler in my, you know, this is just my opinion because I have caught a few bonefish in my life. The reason I would go to Christmas Island is to chase the tri- giant trevally. I mean, giant trevally are just an absolutely in, incredible creature, scary creature. And, uh, uh, the opportunity to, to have a shot at a GT you know, in, you know, standing, you know, basically in a pair of shorts and wading boots in, uh, in knee deep water and have them come up within 15 feet of you. Uh, if that doesn't get you going, nothing will. So, but you know, out of all the, I got to tell you though, out of all the places that I have fished, uh, for saltwater and I've been to Belize and I've been to islands in the Bahamas and, and Mexico obviously and, uh, and Christmas, but my favorite destination sadly is Las Rocas, Venezuela. And I used to go down almost every year. And I think I've made, you know, six or seven trips down to, to Las Rocas and that particular location, it's an archipelago off the coast of Caracas has a little bit of absolutely every destination that you would travel to go fish for bonefish uh, there. You've got the pancake flats. You've got these, these mangrove edged flats. And then you've got these beautiful, long, white, sandy beaches that are totally unique to Las Rocas. Um, it's just a wonderful location. The, the problem is that obviously the government there sucks. So, um, it's just not a place that we can, we can travel to now. Um, and, um, my friend, uh, Chris Yazabal, who, who ran, um, Sightcast down out of Las Rocas, uh, tragically lost his life last year. And so his partner is still trying to keep, you know, the fishery, uh, program going. And I'm, I've tried to stay in contact with them and I'm hoping that someday, uh, when things may be stabilized, um, I can return, but that place holds a very dear spot in my heart. Mm-hmm. So that's cool. Yeah. It sounds so. like maybe somebody that'd be good to have on the podcast if they can get that going again. 
Yeah. No, Ramon would, you know, to share what they have down there is, I mean, that place is just beautiful. It's just really a cool place. So. Yeah, maybe I'll save that one for a, a later podcast. Um, I think the the Christmas Island is sounds interesting. Maybe I, we could hear a little bit more about that. I, the GTs I had um, Yaku Lucas on quite a while ago. He talked about GTs, but he was talking about them on the other side of the world, you know, uh, mm-hmm. in the Seychelles and all that stuff. But yeah, Christmas Island. I mean, <clears throat> that's still that's a a legit place where you can, you know, potentially get a, a massive GT. Can you, I mean, talk about the trip. Is that, so it sounds like it's pretty easy doing that, doing the, in the Hawaii and then yeah, over? Yeah, it's relatively easy. There's only one flight in and one flight out a week. Um, and currently with the pandemic, I don't even know, I haven't even touched bases to see if it's even open yet, but uh, basically you, you access it through Hawaii. Uh, fly to Hawaii, I think the flight outs are on like Tuesday or something like that to, to the island. It's uh, 1,900 and some miles. Uh, you know, it's, it's just a few hundred, it's a hundred and something miles north of the equator. So you just head due south of Hawaii. Uh, it's, a, it's a coral atoll um, and it's out in the middle of freaking nowhere. I mean, it used to be part of the Gilbert Islands um, and it's now the, the Republic of Kiribati. And so it's a, it's a very unique place. Uh, it's basically a giant lagoon with an outer edged island, you know, uh, coral. Um, and, and so you fish for the most part in the lagoon. Um, and there's a, these pancake flats and then deeper into the lagoon, you have these access points where you access them by truck and you drive along and you get out and walk on these flats. Um, you know, in the lagoon, you use these native outrigger kind of power boats they have, uh, to access the, the flats there. Um, but the, the fishery, you know, is, is a little bit dependent upon the local economy. Um, you know, there are times uh, in the past when, you know, maybe, um, maybe the ships weren't bringing provisions. Maybe there was, you know, whatever. Um, and so, you know, I mean, you're on a, you're on a coral rock out there and you got to eat something. And so, you know, there's been times when, you know, it looks, you can see the, the remnants of, of fish that were taken for substance. But, uh, when you, you know, and then you've got, you know, you've got impact from foreign fishing fleets offshore, you know, catching tuna and whatever, but the Island itself and the people, the, the people are wonderful. Uh, you know, like I said, it's, a, it's, a, a pretty, you know, for most people traveling from the United States and having never witnessed any, any poverty in a, in a foreign country, it would probably be a little bit of a shock to see the conditions that these individuals live in. But, but they're, you know, uh, this is, this is their life there. And they, and, and a bonefish guide is one of the highest paid careers, you know, in the, in their country, you know. And they're very well respected. And so, um, on Christmas, um, you know, it's a, there's several, you know, new operations over the years. I mean, when I first started going to Christmas Island, I mean, you had basically one place to go, which was the captain cook. And I think the captain cook had been like a officer's, uh, club, you know, uh, it was kind of a backwater during world war II, uh, supply area and, and the Island for many years had remnants of, you know, that particular, you know, part of history um the island was uh, evacuated you know when they were doing um uh nuclear tests uh back in that day and it wasn't until fairly recent memory that 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 they put a population back on the island but uh uh you know i i want to say it was maybe 15 years ago the u.s and the british uh showed up on the island to uh uh, clean up a lot of the leftover stuff. Uh, you know, they, I mean, when they left, I mean, they parked all the, the deuce and a half and they, you know, all the stuff just left it there. Well, the, the, the Islanders found out that some of those things still ran and still had a little fuel in them. And so they would they'd crank them up and they'd drive them around the Island until they ran out of fuel and then they'd leave them there. So when it came time to clean up everything, you know, they had, things were scattered a little bit. And then, of course, the 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 jungle, rec- you know, reclaims a lot of things. And so it was, you know, it was not an easy task to go through and find things. And they found things they didn't expect to find. I mean, they found, you know, fuel depots and all sorts of stuff that was uh, covered by jungle. So, uh, but um, uh, I think on my on my last trip down there, and it's been a while since I've been to Christmas. Uh, um, 
like I said, it's it like it's it's camping with it's camping with bonefish, and I've kind of got to the point in my You're life where I'm old enough. <laughs> yeah, I I kind of like a little bit of creature comforts, you know, and um, and so because um, uh, you know, quite frankly, I mean, that's part of the experience for me is is the is is you know visiting and socializing with your guests and 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 you know getting to know the people of the area, uh, sampling the food. And, you know, when it comes to Christmas Island, sampling the foods, nearly not high on my list. No. <laughs> but, but, um, uh, that's, that's interesting. So it's kind of a, like you said, camping. I mean, so there isn't like a major, like a five star lodge necessarily down there. No. Well, here, per, here's a perfect story for that. And, and, um, uh, we, my last trip to Christmas, uh, we got off the airplane. My, I had my crew, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, herding everybody into the trucks. And there's this one guy standing off by himself. He's dressed in jeans and he's got a white, uh, he's got a polo, cotton polo shirt. And he's got a little, little day backpack and no luggage. And he's standing there with this, just this, he's almost ashen white look on his face. Like he's in total shock. Right. And so I come up to him. I says, are you okay? He says, um, he's, he says, yeah, I, you know, it's like, uh, I don't have a place to stay. I was expecting to be, you know, like a rental car. I, he says, is there a rental car? Place? I said, no, you got the wrong island. I, There's no rental car here. There's no. And I says, just jump in the truck with my guys and we'll get it all figured out. So we took him back to, um, his name was Xavier and we, he was from Denmark. And, um, um, so we, uh, we took him, to, we took him to the, to Captain Cook and I, I explained the situation to the folks there and they cleaned out a storeroom and they put a bed in there. And so he, he had a place to stay. And so here's the deal. He worked for an airline and his hobby was flying around the world and getting his passport stamped in all these different countries. And, and he expected to be flying to the Christmas Island that is down near, Australia, not the one, not the one that was in the middle of the Pacific. And he expected to just get a rental car, drive to a hotel, you know, spend a week sitting by the pool and then flying out, you know, a week later. He didn't understand that there was no pool. There was no five-star hotel and there was no rental car. So, uh, we, we found him lodging there at the captain cook. And, uh, so they, at that time, the British were there, uh, cleaning up the Island and they had taken over the main dining area. And so they had built a new dining area that was air conditioned and well lit. And, and so my crew was in there and we had the whole place to ourselves basically. And, and I looked around and Xavier wasn't anywhere. So I, I asked, has anybody seen, you know, Xavier and, and no. So I, I went into the other room and here he is you know, shoulder to shoulder with all these sweaty construction guys and sweats pouring off his head. And he's just, you know, and they're sitting there, you know, and there's no air conditioning in there. And I I said, Xavier, come on, you know. And so we basically adopted him for the week and he ended up going fishing with some of the guys. We'd loaned him boots and stuff and let him get out and go fishing. We had some women on the trip that went to visit the local school. They went snorkeling. They went bird watching. He had the best vacation of his life. And when we parted in when we parted in Hawaii, he had tears streaming down his eyes because he didn't want to say goodbye. So it's that's part of the adventure of doing this type of of fishing slash you know travel is meeting these people and sharing those experiences and and you know for many years we kept in contact you know and um, uh, we called him we we nicknamed him the Flying Dutchman but um, uh, <laughs> there you go Xavier but, you know it was it's just uh, you know that's just part of of this whole. Uh, this whole life of, of fly fishing. So it is. And, and the travel is, I, that's what I love about it. And I've been, we're, we're trying to plan a trip down to Ecuador, which is kind of a same sort of thing, just out, you know, camping, doing whatever. And I think the Christmas Island sounds perfect. I, I love the kind of the DIY. I mean, I, I wouldn't mind a, a nice lodge e- either, but it sounds pretty cool. Well, yeah. And it's not really a DIY kind of thing. It's, you, you definitely have to go through an outfitter because oh, right. they, they, you've got the guides and stuff like that, but it's just really basic. I mean, the, the, you know, the, uh, they just don't have much and what they have, they give it to you freely and they share it with you. And, 
but you know, uh, it's, there's, they don't have a lot to give at times. And so it's, uh, you know, I mean, if, if the ship comes in with supplies, then yeah, then there's bottled water available and all that, but it's always good to travel with a water purifier just in case. And, uh, and I always pack a bag with a lot of, uh, beef jerky and uh, dried fruit. When I, when I land in Hawaii, I go to the ABC store and stock up. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Nice. So, so Christmas Island definitely sounds good. And you guys at the shop. So, I mean, I, do you do some tying there? Or what, what do you guys do? I mean, what, what's your big, if you walk into the shop, what would somebody see there? I mean, I, you guys have kind of a normal shop. You've got everything there, but it is. We've got everything. You know, the, the thing I think you would probably understand this more than anybody is that in this industry and in, uh, owning a fly shop, you have to have, you kind of have to be pretty broad based so that you can, especially if you're not a destination shop, if you're not on the banks, if, if you're not on the banks of the Missouri river, uh, you know, you have to have more than just strap flies. And so, uh, like I said, with the experience of, of Josh Lynn and Randy Stetzer and myself, uh, you know, we have traveled to a lot of different places, uh, you know, from uh, Alaska and Russia. And, you know, Josh has been to Russia and, and he's spent some time over in Sweden. And uh, we've all fished up in British Columbia and, and we fished in the tropics. And so when somebody comes in and they're going to a particular destination, um, usually we have some experience there. And we also have the, the, the flies that are necessary or we understand the tackle needs or whatever, and we can help people. Um, and I, I think the important thing is, is that, you know, a lot of times we'll get somebody come in and they'll bring a, their tackle bag and they'll lay it on the counter and say, this is what I have. What do I need? And it's just a matter of just going through their bag and saying, take this, take this, take that, leave that at home. And, uh, that's part of this, you know, that's part of that community thing. And, uh, um, uh, it's, you know, it's just, like I said, it's a great industry to be in. What, what do you need for, I'm just curious on the GTs. If somebody came in and they threw their their uh, their gear on the table you know what what would you tell them I mean, as far as um well yeah. for yeah for christmas island you know normally when i get people into saltwater fish and i explain okay your cornerstone outfit is your your nine foot eight weight with a saltwater line a bonefish line that's your cornerstone it's kind of like the five weight here for trout fishing if you don't have an eight weight you need to have an mm -hmm. eight weight because you're going after bonefish and that's a good all-arounder obviously you can do it with a seven you can do it with a nine but just like you can do it with a four and a, and a six, yeah. the, the eight weights, the number. And then after that for Christmas Island, it's, you need a spare because you're on a rock with no tackle shop for a week. Hmm. And if you break your rod, you're done. And so a spare rod or at least one uh, or two within your group is a great idea. And then for the general, for the GTs, you, you don't, ever take a knife to a gunfight yeah. you take a 12 weight. 12 weight you just step up you take a 12 weight and uh, a, a spare line normally for me christmas island requires uh, two or three eight weights and at least two uh, 12 weights and you can leave the rest of the stuff at home um, yeah. it's you know i've taken nine weights and ten weights over there and i just find that they're just in the way in the truck yeah so an eight um, weight and a 12 know, weight eight and a 12 is is what you need to get it done and and uh uh, it's not, I'm not saying you can't take all that other stuff, but you know, you're kind of limited on what you can pack on the airplane. And those are the tools right yeah. there that'll get the job done 99% of the time. So if I was going to walk in there and I'm saying, okay, I'm heading to Christmas Island, I need a 12 weight. Uh, what are you going to show me as far as a uh, rod, reel, line? Uh, well, you know, it just depends on how much you squeak when you open your wallet. I <laughs> that's mean, there's right. a lot of options out there these days. And, and uh, you can do price point stuff that's made offshore and you can do domestic stuff. I, you know, I've been really happy with uh, both offerings from, uh, uh, well, God, I really, you know, hey, I own a fly shop. But I, I say I, I love the new uh, trend from our friends at Scott of, of making some really high quality rods. They've, they've done really well in the last uh, two editions of their saltwater rods with both the Meridian and the Sector. I think those are great rods. I think Winston, who, you know, I got to admit, I, I kind of bleed green. When I first started working at Kaufman's, um, I was allowed to go and cast all the rods in the shop and, and pick the one that really suited my casting style. And, you know, it was, a, it was a Winston LT and I still have that rod. I still love that rod. 
Um, and I've built a really good relationship with that company uh, over the years. And, and I've actually worked at, at some time with uh, Sam Druckmann, who was their, one of their designers who unfortunately passed away from leukemia. Uh, I worked with Sam on some of the spay rods and some of the single hand rods over the years. And so I, like I said, you know, you build those relationships. Uh, but uh, Winston, you know, uh, their Alpha Series saltwater rods, their Air Series saltwater rods, you know, I mean, the, the, it's really hard. I, I always say there's no really bad fly rods, you know, they're just different. And so it's finding the one that suits the individual. It matches your price point. It fits your casting style. And it's, you know, it's equipped to handle the line that you need to get the job done. So there you go. Okay, perfect. So, so maybe a Winston uh, would get us going and then, um, yeah, real, real wise, same thing, right? You got a, a ton of reels. Yeah. So many. You know, I, again, relationships, uh, C- Kristen Mustad from Nautilus Reels is a good personal friend of mine. So is John Bauer down in Ashland with Bauer Reels. Bauer is now owned by Winston. The, you know, the Bauer RX is an incredible saltwater reel, uh, just very well designed. And when you look in my tackle bag, you'll see reels from Abel. You'll see some hatch reels. You'll see um, Nautilus reels, Bauer reels. Uh, it's, you know, there's a mishmash of stuff in there. And I, I have to say that, you know, coming from motor racing and being semi-mechanical, uh, that's probably the piece of equipment that I really, uh, you know, enjoy the engineering part of. And so, um, that's, you know, I, I love taking reels apart. I love knowing how they work. Um, and quite honestly, you know, the, the reel makers that I know are absolutely incredible guys. And, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, they're fun to be around. And John is, like I said, John's a real good personal friend. And so is Kristen. And we've sat down at the table, you know, the three of us and had some great discussions and, and they're great guys. There you go. So yeah, there's tons of, tons of good stuff. And then I guess just wrapping this up. So if we were going to add a line to this, what, what would you, what would you recommend? Say stay sticking with GTs again if you're just uh, yeah you know I I would say if you're tossing on your you, you, they do make a, a, sp- a specific GT line uh, that has a 50 pound core and that's definitely an advantage. The only thing you have to remember is that your backing if you've just gone with standard mo- you know uh, standard Dacron is 30 pounds. So something's got to something's got to give. Um, you can step up, uh, hatch makes a, a backing now that's, that's, uh, close to 60 pound test and, and, uh, it's not necessarily that nasty gel spun crap. And, um, it's, it's, that would be an option. I never find, you know, I, I don't know if the 50 pound core is all that necessary because at some point in time, you know, you're only dealing with a 12 weight rod. And although that sounds like a lot of your trout fishermen, you know, when you're up against a fish that's, you know, almost as big as you sometimes, that's eh, not a lot. And, and so I would say that, that, um, uh, 30 pound test backing with a, with, uh, with a, a 12 weight line that will throw what you're going to throw. I love the new, um, uh, flats pro, uh, from, uh, from Rio, oh, from Rio that yeah. line. Uh, yeah. I've been fishing that on, on a lot of my saltwater rods. Um, haven't really found the combination with the bonefish taper, but the, just the standard felt flats pro, uh, on the stuff that I love to cast is, is money. And, uh, so I'm, you know, I'm afraid I'm kind of hooked on that. Although I do on most of my trips, I will take a collection of things so that I can try them and, you know, form an opinion because at the end of the day, someone's going to ask me just like you did, you know, and you know, what line should I use? And a lot of, a lot of it has to do with the rod that you're using too. And so that's the first question I have, what rod are you going to put it on? Is that Winston, you mentioned the Winston LT was the one you still love. Is that, is that still a good rod could be used for like a 12 weight? No, no, that rod was a specialty rod. That was a, it was a trout series rod. It was a five piece rod. It had internal, internal spigot ferrules. Um, it's a, it's a really cool rod. It hasn't been in production for years. Like spigot ferrule. This would be like a bamboo type of ferrule. Well, it's an internal ferrule. Oh, it's, it's just a internal. spigot ferrule. So it's, it's, yeah. So it's got a, it's got a fiberglass plug that basically holds the two sections together and they're, ha- they have to be hand fitted. Uh, so they, they, you know, you push them in through the thick end and then you, f- you try to put the, the thin end on and then you have to s- take them out and sand them and put them back in. And so there's a lot of hand work on that. And right now at Winston, my friend Joe Bajan is, is, from my understanding, the only individual that really remembers how to do that because they haven't used that technology for a long time. Um, 
a, a funny little sidebar is is uh, when when Jennifer and I went to Yellowstone last year, I took one of my my LT four weights with me, and she fell in love with it. And I could see the writing on the wall that I was going to lose that rod. And so on the way home, I kind of messaged my friends at Winston and said, "You got any spare parts for those things?" And it took quite a while. But uh, they made a one-off uh, recreation of that rod for for my wife Jennifer no and put her Amazing. name put her name on it, and so uh, I get mine back, and I, I I'm probably going to cause Winston a lot of headaches by saying that. But, right? Uh, they don't have any more parts, folks. So <laughs> forget it. Nice. Uh, but but Jennifer has her own now, and so I don't have to worry about losing mine. And that that particular rod, it's a it's a eight foot three inch four weight is 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 a little sports car it is so fun to fish and uh it's perfect for the small creeks in yellowstone and so we're you know we're going to be taking that here at the end of the month as we head that direction so oh cool you're heading ahead in yellowstone and is that a is that kind of a more of a medium action rod yeah definitely uh definitely it has a little bit more backbone than say a, a fiberglass or a, uh even the old g series from scott but it's it's very likened to say the the, the current G two series from Scott. Um, it's a it's just a good modern action. It's a great trout trout rod. You know, just a great trout rod. I'm curious. You mentioned, um, you know, uh, the the Kaufmans. I was just thinking about again. You know, obviously they influenced you. But there's been a few people. You know, I, I didn't even you know Hazel right who has the Deschutes. Oh shop. yeah, John. Yeah, Hazel, I mean, yeah. how many people yeah. were do, do you think that went through Kaufmans that are out still in the industry doing so? There are quite a few because you had you had Randall right. He was the head the head guy, and then his brother came in. I think later. Um, no, no, Randall and Randall and Lance were a team from the beginning. Yeah. Oh, and, they were. Um, uh, yeah, they were a team from the beginning. Uh, I think Randall, you know, he was the one that you know wrote the books and tied the flies and did all that. And and, and Lance was kind of the business, you know, running the shop kind of guy. Uh, but you know, there's there's a lot of people that went through the uh, the doors at Kaufman that are still in the industry. I mean, you know, George Cook. Is oh, one right, of George them. was and, there. Okay. Yeah, and so. There's a lot of people that ha- at some point in time, you know, were touched by th- by those two individuals, and I'd I'd have to say, and I it's it's only fair to say that both Randall and and Lance Kaufman uh, truly helped shape uh, you know fly fishing retail. Um, you know, I mean, they started in their in the garage, you know, and they they went to you know building an empire. Um, unfortunately, you know was with some certain circumstances you know uh, <laughs> rome fell including travel right they built it they had a huge travel before it was uh, before the red dog and folks like that were here right yeah so they they were you know they were one of the one of the first with uh you know mail order catalog and and so yeah it was uh it was a, it was a very impressive business and and uh you know, uh, it's sad the way that it ended up and it's, but you know, it's still, when you look back at it in its heyday, it was something to be proud of. So we had uh, Jack Dennis was on a while back and he, we talked a little bit about Randall and he, he mentioned that, um, you know, maybe we'll get Randall. It'd be good to get him on the podcast and hear, you know, hear some of the stories. Yeah, No, Randall, Randall's been in my shop. Uh, he and Mary were off to, I want to say Cuba. And so she needed some boots. And so Randall came in and bought some waiting, waiting boots for her. I've seen Randall a couple of times and, um, uh, uh, you know, he is a very creative individual. Uh, I think he spends most of his time now down in the Jackson Hole area or Jackson. Um, he's got a place there. Um, and, um, you know, I might reach out to him. We're going to be down in that direction. Uh, I think we actually fished the Snake River the 1st of October. We're, we're fishing with Mark Fuller, who was with Cork- Corkers and now um, has his own rep company, but he also owns part of an outfitting business down there. I think it actually was Jack Dennis's business yeah. in Jackson. Yeah. That's right. And so um, uh, we're going to fish with Mark uh, on the Snake. And I'm looking forward to that. I've not drifted the snake in that area before, so it should be a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, you're going to have a good trip. That's cool. Yeah, we're doing a, 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 a 12-day trout bum road trip. And uh, we've got basically 14 rivers kind of on the on the list in the 14 days or, or 12 days. So, yeah, it's it's going to be. I'd say that seems challenging. So you're almost a, a river per day. Well, there's some some locations where um, last year when we had all the smoke here in, in the area, 
uh, we were supposed to be in steelhead camp and the first week of the camp kind of got canceled. And so the folks that were signed up for the first part of the week, you know, we were supposed to be there all week hosting and we just gave up our spots and let some of the folks move over to the second part of the week as the river, as it kind of cleared up. And since we already had a house sitter lined up, um, we just took off, you know, my, my forerunner is rigged up for, for adventure travel, um, fully self-contained kitchen, refrigerator, pop-up tent on the top. And, uh, all we had to do was switch out steelhead gear for trout gear. And we took off down the road, kind of heading to Idaho, but then we found that the smoke was just as bad there. So we decided, well, let's head towards Jackson. And we, and instead of Jackson, we ended up in Yellowstone. Yep. <laughs> so, um, uh, I had to call ahead and get some rubber soled boots cause you're not allowed felt soles in the, in the park. And, uh, but we fished there and we had such a great time that we decided we're going to, we're going to do it, but we're going to plan it this time. And so we're, we're actually kind of focusing on some of the smaller waters in Yellowstone, as well as just in Montana on the way there. And then, uh, we'll head South into, um, uh, Gravant. We've got a couple nights at a campground in Gravant and we'll fish there and then fish the snake with Mark. And then we'll head up and, and, um, maybe fish the Henry's Fork yeah, on our way home. And the Henry's so. Fork. Yeah. Yeah. And we, that's, that's awesome. I, we were just there in Yellowstone. Uh, I guess it was July did kind of a, a same sort of thing, a road trip and, you know, camped out of the, out of the truck. What's your favorite river? Uh, you know, in, in Yellowstone. Uh, gosh, we, you know, I didn't, you know, if it would have been me only, you know, it would have been, I would have fished a lot more. I had, I've got a couple of young kids, so we did a lot of hiking and stuff, but, um, my favorite, I mean, the Lamar Valley, we fished, mm-hmm. uh, I mean the Lamar river, like literally right in the middle of, which is crazy because it's this huge Valley. There's bison, but I had a day where yep. I was, there was a herd of bison right near me. I had amazing fishing, right? A period of time where I was on the surface, just dry flies, one after another. I didn't land a lot of fish, but had a lot of action. And then, you know, the bison were there. I found like this bison skull and then a, um, a badger chased me. It was, you know, it was this amazing, it was just this cool experience. And the bison is crazy. That's, that's the one thing that it's so, it's so visceral to be around them. So I don't know. We're, we're definitely going back every year if we can. It's just such a cool place. Well, that's, that's the thing about Yellowstone. Once you've been there, I didn't go there and, until maybe, you know, I don't know, six years ago for the first time, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm pushing it. Well, I'm 64 years old. So, you know, I kind of missed out a lot. So, uh, but since being there, I've been back there almost every year since. And uh, I've been there in late fall. I had a, you know, I had an AFTA dealer summit in October one year. So I, I did the dealer summit and I, I drove to, to Bozeman and then I just dropped down into the park and camped by myself for, for three or four days until the snow finally drove me out of there and, and fished, um, uh, fish the Lamar, uh, fish the Gibbon, fish the Madison, fish the fire hole. Um, it's, you know, once you go in there, there's so much to see. You can't see it in one trip unless you take, uh, you know, two weeks to do it. Uh, it's a, it's an incredible park. Uh, we're going to focus on some of the smaller w- watersheds. We're going to, we're going to do Soda Butte. We're going to do Pebble Creek. We're going to do the Lamar. Um, we're going to do our favorite, which is the Gibbon. Uh, although Soda Creek really kind of, or Soda Butte kind of really, uh, it did well with us last year. We had a lot of fun there. Um, and then we're going to, ex- you know, we're, we're going to take some trout space. We're going to see if the migratory fish are coming into the Madison. We were a little early last year. And so we'll, we'll see, uh, maybe, uh, by the time we drop down, we made a couple reservations on our way out of the park last year. And so that's the best way to kind of do it. And we, we anchored a couple nights at, um, uh, the, um, Madison campground, and uh, that gives us a place inside the park to camp. So we're relatively close. Um, and then we'll just, you know, we'll kind of see. So we're, we're going to try to get into uh, some first come spots up in the northern part of the park. And then uh, we'll drop down into the, the main body of the park and then eventually head out down towards the Tetons and into Jackson. Yeah, and so, Jackson go out that uh, way. Yep. Yeah. Wow, yeah. so, sounds perfect. So you got so you got that on tap. What what else uh, in the next uh, say year? Do you have anything? Is that uh, I mean, what, so the travel wise, obviously the COVID's kind of you know made things crazy for everybody. Do you guys typically do a lot of traveling during the year? 
Well, you know, it, it, that it has definitely kind of thrown a damper on it. And, and normally uh, we would try to do, you know, uh, a couple hosted trips a year to foreign destinations. It's just really hard to do that. Um, I mean, travel is opening up. And I think, you know, as we move in, you know, we're, we're hopeful that as we move into the new year, uh, with the increase in, in vaccinations, um, you know, that we can, we can see, uh, people's comfort level, you know, increase a little bit so that we can, you know, we can take a group down. I've got a prime week. It's actually, uh, the week of, uh, Valentine's day and my 65th birthday. And so we're, we're heading down to Grand Slam Lodge in Punta Allen. And uh, it's, you know, it's going to be, uh, uh, we'll have at least two fiestas that week. So it'd be a trip not to miss. Uh, and uh, we had such a wonderful group in uh, 2020. We actually got in a trip in February of 2020 before, our, you know, before COVID even hit. And uh, we had a fantastic time and the fishing was great and the people were incredible and the food there and the lodging there is just off the charts. So it's a it's a fun trip, and uh, we're very hopeful. I've got a few people already signed up for it, and a couple of them are some very close friends that want to be part of the the celebration. And one of them is a freaking character, and I just love him to death. He's a he's a retired lawyer from up in Seattle area, and um, um, I, I, I've got a photograph of him wearing a Chiquita banana suit that I I. I tricked him into wearing one trip down to the Bahamas and there's a story in itself, but, uh, uh, he's just a wonderful, wonderful human being. And, uh, I'm looking forward to spending some more time with him. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a beautiful destination and, and I'm, we're hopeful. Uh, but locally, you know, we, we're going to continue to do what we do. You know, our, our trout bum road trip, quite honestly, is trying to inspire our community to look beyond what they normally would be doing this time of year, which is chasing steelhead, and and look at the other opportunities that are available, not only here in Oregon, but you know beyond our own borders here, and maybe push themselves beyond their comfort zone, beyond the and, and go in and see some new places. I mean, how many people, you know, listening to this conversation that live here in the Portland area, how many p- people have fished uh, Donner and Blitzen, for instance? Or how many people have have, have gone and, and fished the Henry's Fork or, uh, you know, gone to Yellowstone in the fall and seen the animals and fished the water there? You know, there's a lot of opportunity um, and, you know, sadly, we've got some issues in the Columbia Basin with our steelhead. Um, and they definitely, you know, the issues of concern, but, um, there are other opportunities and it's extremely important for people to understand that, uh, they need to stay connected. They need to stay connected to our fisheries so that, um, they can advocate for our fisheries. And so don't hang up your waders, uh, get out there, you know, um, instead of hiring a guide to go steelhead fishing, hire a guide to go fall trout fishing, you know, and, uh, get out there and do it because, uh, you know, our guides, our guides and outfitters, uh, and destination fly shops, um, uh, you know, during this, you know, they need support, uh, and, uh, the community has to kind of rise up and do that and walking away from a fishery um, you know, um, is not the thing to do. So I just say, get out there and, and, and explore some new stuff. And, you know, if you don't know where to go, stop into your local fly shop and ask, say, Hey, I'd, I'd like to go do something different. This is what I normally do. What do you think? You know, um, I've got a friend that comes in the shop who's written a couple of books, um, you know, on fishing and, you know, the, uh, you know, fishing the the West and fishing in Montana, you know, and we've got, we've got those t- of resources available and uh, maybe to inspire people. And like I said, that's kind of what our trout bum road trip is all about is trying to inspire people. We'll be, you know, we'll be doing the standard social media stuff, but you know, we do a weekly newsletter and uh, we've been kind of building up to the trip and we'll cover it in that. So Hopefully, you know, maybe somebody will just kind of get charged and decide, gosh, I need to go do something like that. And I've always wanted to go down and fish the green or I wanted to go fish this or whatever. You know, the, don't put it off. You know, life is if one thing this pandemic has taught us is don't put off that, you know, that trip that you wanted to do. Don't put off hugging that person or telling that person how much you feel about them. 
you know, do those things now. Don't put them yeah. off. Yeah, yeah. And we, we had, um, you know, the Henry Henry's Fork, we had an episode with Mike Lawson, which was great. And the green is one I would love to do an episode on that. We've kind of expanded. It's kind of been interesting because we started out with a steelhead focus here, you know, a, a number of years ago now, but have expanded into more just general fly fishing. And it's been a lot of fun because I've connected with a lot of people like Mike Lawson and others. But um, yeah, the steelhead, you know, like you mentioned, we're in a, in a place. And I remember in the early 90s, you probably do too. Um, you know, my dad was guiding uh, in the late 80s, 90s, and he pretty much quit guiding right back in that, at least that period, because there was this period when the numbers were tanking like they are now. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, you know, it took a while, but the, you know, the numbers climbed back. And by the, by the 2000s, 2010s, we were seeing crazy numbers, right? So I think we're going to get back there. Um, It's just a matter of, you know what I mean, time. And like my dad said, we've all got limited years on the planet, right? Yep. Yep. Well, I think that the situation currently, I mean, there, there's a lot of unknowns and things have changed. Yes, I have, you know, I mean, I started fishing for steelhead uh, in the early 70s on the Deschutes. And um, and so I've seen a lot of change with the introduction of hatchery fish and, and whatever, you know, and the changes at the dam, all those things. The river changes. Uh, you know, the river adapts to somewhat. And in the past, you know, runs have been cyclic where you know they change the cycle changes but uh there's also a lot of unknowns right now uh with the changes we're seeing in the climate the warming of the planet and and all of that and then you know population impacts not only our country but other countries so we really don't know uh you know what is going on with our fish and that's the that's the scary part uh you know i i put a piece in my newsletter yesterday and i liken it you know fisheries management is is almost like they're using Ouija boards and, and chicken bones tossed in the dirt, you know, to read what is, you know, the forecast what's going to happen. And that's not science. And the problem is, is that the science is changing and we can't, you know, we're, we're not ahead of it. You know, we're, we haven't, we don't have the answers and that's the scary part. So I think that, you know, what's going on right now in the Columbia Basin is going to require sacrifices from all user groups. Uh, and that's, that's the brutal truth, you know, and, uh, I don't have the answers. I don't think anybody has the answers, but the thing is, is that we have to come together and have the conversation. And, uh, one of the topics, you know, that I covered in my, my spiel and my newsletter yesterday is these are prickly conversations that nobody wants to have nobody. And it's, you know, we're not going to accomplish anything pointing fingers. We can't point fingers at the tribes. We can't point fingers at the at the gear fishermen. We can't point fingers at the dams. We can't point fingers at, at the sea lions. I mean, if you're going to point a finger, stand in front of a mirror. Uh, and, and the, you know, we all are the problem. Uh, I don't know if you're, you're old enough to remember the cartoon Pogo, but it's, we have met the enemy and he's oh, us. Pogo, no, I'll, put a, I'll find a, uh, see if I can find a, a video, put that in the show notes. I, I don't know Pogo, but um, I, uh, I do know uh, one thing. I, um, I'll put a link out to John McMillan as well. He was on the podcast. He's a very well respected with TU and he broke down his take on it, um, you know, where we're at current status and stuff like that. So he has a good, a good take on it. I think that's, that's, uh, yeah, like you said, though, climate change and all that. But uh, we'll leave that for a, another one, uh, J- Joel. But, uh, yeah, anything, anything else? The good thing is is that anglers, especially steelhead anglers, and especially steelhead anglers who, who ply the waters with a, a skating fly, are optimists. We are born optimists. And I think that that's a, an important trait as we go forward because it's that optimism that is going to keep us advocating for the resource. And, uh, we'll, you know, that's all we can do at this point and, uh, uh, let our voices be heard and advocate for the resource and go f- and just go fishing. You know, we've got a plenty of, plenty of opportunity. This is not the time to hang up your waders. This is the time to get out there and get, this is the, I mean, right now, this is the best time to fish in Oregon Yeah, you know? it's or anywhere for that matter. Yeah, it is. We're, so, we're in right now. We're in, um, yeah, we're September, right? This is like uh, we're, we're it's prime time. This is prime time, yep. man. Yeah, stuff stuff's going. There's there's uh, all sorts of good stuff. So hey, Joel, before we get out, I just want you mentioned the race cars a couple times. I'm just curious. So so take us there just for a second on the race cars. What were you doing? Uh, like what cars? This is like NASCAR. What was this? Oh no, this is just total uh, club racing sports cars. I 
um, I wanted to, you know, my dad was a general manager of Portland National Raceway. And uh, he, he, he really brought that racetrack from just a, a picnic table and, you know, a, a piece of pavement to a, a world-class racing facility, uh, bringing in the Indy cars and bringing in uh, IMSA sports cars and all that. And uh, I'd go out and visit dad and uh, Dane Pederessi had a racing school out there and I was getting into autocrossing and he had a device called the skid car and I started hanging out there and helping out with a skid car. Next thing you know, I was teaching in the skid car and I hold the number three training certificate in the skid car. Uh, and I went to work for Dane and uh, kind of left photography behind. It was just a natural transition and uh, ran the racing school. Uh, you know, did all the mechanic works on the, on the, on the school cars and then, um, would travel around the country and install skid cars on uh, on platforms at, at police agencies. Oh, yeah. You know, I've, I've been to Qu- I've been to Quantico and, and work with the FBI. I've been to different police agencies around the country, and I'd install the platform and um, uh, teach their their instructors and and then certify them, and then come back a year later and, and recertify some more instructors. It's a it's a great device and one that you know if somebody's really into you know teaching their kids to drive mm-hmm. or whatever the skid cars skid cars. Do it. But yeah, I used to race uh, sports cars. Um, my first one was a Volkswagen Rabbit, and it was uh, a, probably the most populated class at, at PIR. It was, it was called it was called the Bunny Bash because there was like nineteen of us, <laughs> and it made for some really good close racing, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, wow! But like I said, it's a great way to make a small fortune as long yeah. as you start with a is, large is that one. still going? <laughs> is Portland is is that still out going? Yeah. Oh yeah. In fact, I think this weekend, the twelfth of September. I don't. Know, I don't know when this is going to get published, but the twelfth of September, the Indy cars are back in. Portland. Oh wow! And uh, so yeah, it's, it's it's still going strong. It's still going. It's a it's a city owned racetrack. It's a park, Amazing. and uh, uh, it's it's one of the few parks that actually makes money. And uh, I'm really proud of what my dad did uh, over the years at PIR, and uh, it's that's really a, cool. It's a truly a world world class yeah. race. Yeah, that's awesome. And and so your dad, what, what I'm curious, just you know, it sounds like he was a big influence on you. What what was something that he, you know you learned from him, or a big takeaway you think when you think of your dad? Well, you know, dad was he's a, he's an angler. Yeah, uh, he lives about two miles from me here. Um, he's obviously, he's, he celebrated his birthday last Monday and, uh, he's, uh, 80 something. Um, you know, we've fished together in Mexico and, and Christmas Island and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I just think that the, um, the qualities that he taught me, um, that I reflected in my own person, uh, are the most important things. I mean, sure. He taught me a lot about casting and fishing and all that kind of stuff, but I think just, uh, just being a good human being, you know? Yeah. Yep. Yep. And he was never, so, I mean, it's interesting the race car, I guess, well, again, that's another one we'll have to leave for another time, but, um, <laughs> it's, it, it's interesting because you went from commercial fishing, uh, race car photography, I mean, in fly fishing out of all those four kind of, uh, you know, kind of fields, which, well, I mean, are, is, are there a lot of similarities? Well, I tell you, here's the secret to a, to a successful uh, and happy work life is is always do what you love. And all of those all of those career paths that I chose were things that I was extremely interested in and was passionate about. And you know, when you're passionate about something, it's not work. And I think the secret to working is make your job, you know, you know, make your living from some from something you love. So. Uh, you know, and then you never work a day in your life. And I, I'm, you know, I've never had a real job. So. No. So when you, so when you go in the fly shop, you're never like, oh man, I got to go into the fly shop again today. No, I love it. Uh, and, and my wife, Jennifer will tell you, sometimes she says, you need to just stay home, let the guys do their thing. And it's like, yeah, but I, I kind of yeah. like it, you know, I know I like being there. I like, I like, you know, I like hearing familiar voices. I like seeing people, you know, um, uh, I just, you know, I mean, these are my friends. You know, these, yeah. these are, these are my, this is my community, you know? Yeah, so. totally. All right, Joel. Well, this is, this has been fun. I, I could chat with you for, you know, all day here. Uh, I'll let you get out of here. Um, if people have questions for you, we'll send them over to uh, Royal Treatment Flyfishing.com. Yep. There yeah. you go. And, and, uh, and Royal Treatment, just quickly before I'm curious, the Royal Treatment is a, that's a fly, right? Is that what, what's that fly yeah, look like? Is it back a, in, back yeah. in, in uh, 1997, I was on the shoots with my dad. I'd been back East. I bought some time materials at a place called Hunters and, uh, something unusual. And, and I was putting the fly together. I tied this fly 
with these unusual materials I had. One of them was a kind of a teal dyed uh, pheasant crust. And I went out the next morning above, we had a, a cabin up there David, at uh, uh, North Junction. And oh, yeah, North Dave, Junction. Sure. Yeah. So I went up to, I went up to Davidson Flat, yep. uh, just there below the island. And was swinging a fly with my spay rod. I had two of these things tied in tandem back in the day. That's what we used to do. We'd fish two flies. And uh, I caught two beautiful steelhead as the sun just crested the canyon behind me. I was re- I was fighting the second fish. And she was out in the river jumping. And the steam was rising off of the river. Cause, you know, yep. the, and the, the, she was making smoke rings almost <laughs> when she landed, you know. And it was incredible, you know. And I watched wow. that fish. And I got her in. And she's beautiful wild fish. And. I reached down and took the fly out of her mouth and let her swim away. And I sat there and this, and the sun kind of lit up the fly and it's a, a peacock, uh, you know, peacock back, you know, wing. And it's kind of unusual. And it's, in, 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 this is your fly. This is the royal treatment is your, your pattern. Yeah. It's my fly. And there you go. Uh, I, I figured that I just received the royal treatment and that's what I named it. So. I love that. Yeah. It's a great yeah. name and great, great fly. I'll, uh, I'll put well, it. Uh, yeah. It's been a great, it's been a great fly. It's a popular fly with a lot of my customers, mm-hmm. but more importantly, it's a great way to do business. Yeah, exactly. All right, Joel. Well, thanks again for the time. This has been good to finally connect with you here and uh, I'll keep in touch on everything and uh, yeah, I'll let you know when this gets out, we'll, we'll get it out to the, to the world and, uh, and introduce everybody that doesn't know yet to the Royal Treatment. Great. Well, thanks. And, and good luck with your podcast. I've listened to some episodes, a lot of my friends on there. It's great. I love it. Thanks, Joel. I'll talk to you soon. You bet. No worries. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all links, and everything else we covered today, head over to whipflyswing.com slash 261. 261. Please uh, click that subscribe button if you get a chance. Um, it might be follow now uh, on some of the apps out there, but uh, follow or subscribe. Either way, uh, click that button so you get notified when our next episode goes live. That's a wrap. That's all I have for you today. Thanks for stopping by to check out the show and looking forward to catching up with you soon. Maybe catch you online or on the river. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.